Hello, welcome to the Monday, June 20th, 2022 edition of the Sands and Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich, and today I'm recording from Jacksonville, Florida. Splunk late last week released a critical patch for the Splunk Enterprise deployment server. The deployment server is an optional component, but it's very commonly enabled because it allows you to centrally manage Splunk forwarders. To accomplish this, the deployment server is able to essentially push configuration files to Splunk forwarders and other Splunk instances that are used within an organization. So it's a simple central configuration tool. These configuration files may also include binaries that are executed by the recipient of the package. Now, before you think that this is actually the root of the problem here, it's part of it, but uh, not really what's causing the vulnerability. Typically, the deployment server just pushes files out to the forwarder, so code is executed on the forwarder as instructed by deployment uh, server. The forward itself should really only receive those files, but the vulnerability that was patched late last week does allow forwarders to actually execute commands on the Splunk deployment server. Now, since you typically have these forwarders installed throughout your enterprise on different endpoints, what this means is if one of those endpoints gets compromised, then an attacker could use the Splunk forwarder to compromise the deployment server. And once the deployment server is compromised, then of course the attacker could compromise the enterprise by pushing malicious configuration from the deployment server. And of course, these forwarders, they have to read all these log files, which requires privileges. So they typically do run as system on Windows. No public exploit is available for uh, this vulnerability at this point, but uh, you can imagine it's critical CSS score of 9.0. So certainly something that you need to address. However, Splunk doesn't make that terribly easy. Late last week, Essentially, as a patch, Splunk published a new major version of Splunk, Splunk 9.0. And the way you patch is you upgrade to this new major version. Of course, upgrading to major versions of products is always a little bit a precarious undertaking. That's why you need to do some sufficient testing before you actually go ahead with this. There are a couple other things that you could do in order to mitigate this vulnerability. You could just disable the deployment server, of course, then you lose the functionality, but you could just enable it whenever you want to push out a new configuration. If you do so, just be careful when you disable the deployment server, you also have to restart Splunk because otherwise existing connections may still continue. The other thing that you could do is if you're a little bit hesitant to basically move your main Splunk instance to 9.0, you could just set up a second Splunk instance that uh, runs 9.0. You only use it for the deployment server and uh, leave the rest still running on your existing older version of uh, the uh, Splunk uh, enterprise server. So that would... Uh, Basically, a little compromise here uh, to allow you more time for testing, and that appears to be working fine so far. Of course, this only affects you if you're using Splunk Enterprise, if you're using it on premise. Splunk's cloud offerings are not affected. And on Friday, Brad also published a malware analysis diary again. This time he went over a malicious email sample that pushed the Malenbox uh, malware, if I pronounce uh, this uh, correctly, which then led to Cobalt Strike via an interesting sort of chain of events. So first you get a fairly generic spam message that says something about, hey, here is the document I wanted to send you. It includes a zipped HTML file. Now, once you open that zip file and open the HTML file, it simulates a SharePoint lookalike page. I wouldn't really call it phishing because it's all done locally, uh, but um, yeah, the effect is sort of similar. And then within that SharePoint page or that SharePoint lookalike page, you see what looks like yet another zip file. So now just like you used to, you can basically just click that file or copy it uh, to your 
uh, desktop and uh, that's sort of uh, when you download that and it's not really downloading because it's already on your system just sort of embedded in that html file uh, then sort of the remainder of the exploit chain happens uh, you're then downloading your dlls and uh, your msis and such and then in the end you're ending up with cobalt strike so Th that SharePoint lookalike trick, I haven't really seen it uh, like it yet. I have seen these sort of self-contained HTML pages with um, additional content like ISO files and such in there. Uh, attackers are just playing with um, these more complex tricks to uh, basically bypass uh, user education here. For more details, sample files, and in the case of compromise, uh, just see Brad's blog. And when we think about a ransomware, we usually think about compromised endpoints. And so a lot of the ransomware protection kind of focuses on endpoints. Cloud storage is often not really sort of considered a target necessarily of a ransomware because it often has automatic versioning and backups. Uh, so it makes it kind of easier uh, to recover uh, from ransomware. But uh, actually, we had something similar in Windows. Uh, we do have shadow copies and restore points, and ransomware usually just disables them or deletes them. Well, Proofpoint last week published a blog post showing how a similar technique is possible with SharePoint Online and OneDrive. There's a user configurable option that allows the user to adjust how many versions of a document are being kept. The attacker uh, could now adjust that option to set it to a lower number. So for example, if you only retain three versions or you can actually just set it to one version, you just have to encrypt the file once or three times if you leave it at three and then all the versions that are being stored are encrypted. Yes, you can set it actually uh, to one, uh, which then makes it even sort of trivial to do uh, the encryption. The default is 500, which would take quite a long time to really encrypt all the files. So that would make it more likely that the attacker is being discovered while uh, the uh, encryption is still in progress. We have, of course, seen attackers that outright like delete uh, files uh, from cloud storage and such. That's certainly not that uncommon. This is really something that uh, Proofpoints have considered as a weakness of uh, SharePoint. Nothing they have actually seen exploited yet, but something to watch out for. In order to do that, of course, the attacker does need to have access to user credentials. But then again, with ransomware, kind of always sort of assume, like I said, so that compromised endpoint so getting access uh, to credentials may not necessarily be sort of the big hurdle at that point uh, to overcome and then a quick shout out to our sans.edu classes of 2020 and 2021 we had our commencement ceremony uh, this weekend in cleveland so congratulations uh, to everybody uh, for what they accomplished and that's it for today. Thanks again for listening. Just a little heads up, there will be no podcast for Friday. There will only be four podcasts this week due to uh, travel uh, arrangements. Thanks and talk to you again tomorrow. Bye.